Luke 16. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Praise you. Look at 1 John 1, 8 through 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All it takes is for us to confess, and that's wonderful. Let's now sing the song, Just As I Am, followed by the chorus, I Come Broken. We have been working our way through the book. We have slowed down a little bit in the first part here of chapter 5, and we're going to slow down even a little more today. If you're visiting with us, just to do some quick review, I'm sure our people could recite this to you by now, but repetition, good repetition does aid learning. In the book of Ephesians, Paul structures his book so that he builds a a foundation for gospel living or a foundation of new walking. That's the operative word for living in chapters 4 through 6. Chapters 1 through 3, he builds that foundation for walking with the doctrine of the gospel that that pertains to gospel theology in Christ, what God has done in Christ to secure us. He has, chapter 1, blessed us in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And that's, remember chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, that's adoption, that's predestination, that's forgiveness, that's, in chapter 2, it's reconciliation, the mystery of the gospel in and, and Christ and, and His great love for us. And 
Paul builds this foundation of our life in Christ. Remember, chapters 1 through 3 is living in Christ, what God has done. And chapters 4 through 6 is living out what Christ has done, or what God has done in Christ. And chapter 4 begins this. Paul uses this phrase in chapter 4, verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He challenges them in chapter 4, verse 17, to no longer walk as the Gentiles do. That is, the unsaved Gentiles no longer walk as they do. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he urges them to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And then remember, we started last week that he encourages them to walk in love. Light as we are light in verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. So walk as children of light. Last week we began working through verses 6 down to verse 14. And I gave you our outline. And because it was a little more complex, and so you can get that again today. But remember, in this passage, Paul uses, verses 6 to 14, he uses the structure of imperative and impetus. Imperative, that's the command, and the impetus, and that is the reason for that command. So I'm going to review last week very quickly for you, and then actually what we're going to do this morning is we're going to zoom out and we're going to go all the way back to Genesis, and I'm going to do something that maybe I should have done from the very outset of this, and we're going we're gonna to look at a concept of biblical sexuality, because I have been, I have been largely assuming agreement and assuming we're all working on the same terms and we're all understanding things the same way when I use the term biblical sexuality. But I want to I really make sure we define that well and I think now's the time to slow this down as Paul, as we find our text, find ourselves in a text where Paul in the New Testament is instructing us in pure living. So let's read verses 6 through 14, then I'll do some review for you, okay? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says... Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Just to review, remember last week I I gave you the main idea of verses 6 6 through 14 as walking in light is incompatible with worldly lust. Walking in light, that is this light of the gospel that that Paul has explained for us in chapters 1 through 3, that now we're supposed to walk in, in, in newness of life as we were darkness and now we are light. That is impossible if we are also trying to pursue everything that he warns against in verses 3 through 5. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you can be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And verse 5 there is referring to the sins in verses 3 through 4, and he's saying you cannot characteristically live this way and claim the name of Jesus Christ. Christ purifies you. So having considered all of this, let's pray, and then we'll review, and then, like I said, we're going to zoom out from chapter 5 and go all the way back to Genesis and discuss the concept of 
sexual immorality in verses 3 through 5 and contrast that with biblical purity. Let's pray. Father, we have a heavy task before us. It's heavy enough. The preaching of the Word is heavy enough. This is your truth being brought to bear upon the hearts of your people. I pray this morning that you would give ears to hear. You would give humble hearts. You would make plain our sin as you make plain the Scriptures. And you would assure us of your grace to transform us. It is a It's a weighty task because of the topics that we will discuss, and so I ask for your discernment. And I pray as Paul pray, as I pray as Paul says, that you would help me to speak with clarity because it's how we ought to speak, and you would help me to speak with boldness because it's how we ought to speak. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So to do some very quick review of what we did last week. We got through part point three, and then we just basically started on point four. Imperative and impetus number one. The imperative is, of course, do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you with empty words. And remember I said specifically that these are not unbelievers. These are professing believers who are who are trying to say that you can both live for Christ and maintain a life of physical liberation. The imperative is, do not be deceived. And the impetus is, because of these things, that is the sins in verses 3-5, through five, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Paul makes this clear elsewhere in chapter 1 of Romans. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Colossians 3 verse 5, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. So the imperative is not to be deceived by sexual sin, And namely, those who would say you can live a life of sexual liberation and live for Christ. Secondly, are the imperative in verse 2. So imperative and impetus number 2. Imperative is do not become partakers. In other words, not only should you not be deceived by them, you shouldn't participate with them. And the reason is that you were darkness and now you are light. Your your identity was darkness, and now you are light. It's not just that you lived in darkness. you You were yourself darkness, but Christ has made you light. In him is life, and he was the light of men. And he has shined that light upon the darkened hearts of sinners and transformed them so that now they are not just dark hearts with a little bit of light. They actually are changed hearts. Imperative and impetus number three is that we are to walk then as children of light. He's going to use this, this again, walking terminology, that we should follow this out. Remember chapters one through three is hiking the, hiking the Himalayas of theology, and chapters four through six is the walk home, how we live until the journey is done. So we're supposed to walk as children of light. That means we're going to live differently. That means we're going to make different decisions. Remember when we started talking, when we introduced this walking terminology back in the beginning of chapter 4, it is volitional and it is directional. You make choices to walk somewhere and walking somewhere takes you somewhere. So you walk as children of light. You make decisions that befit the light that is shone into your heart. And you go a direction that follows Jesus. And the impetus is that the fruit of light pleases God. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And we began point four last week, but we didn't get deeply into it. And so we're going to end review of last week there. And now I'm going to ask you, To zoom out. So we were looking at the trees of Ephesians chapter 5. And now we're actually going to zoom out and we're going to look at the whole forest of Scripture. But it's just the very edge of the forest. Because I'm going to ask you to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 with me now. 
Like I said, I have been largely assuming, and I think I can rightfully assume, agreement in most ways. In other words, when I say biblical sexuality and that it is, that it's the best way to live, that it is God's intention, you agree with me, except that the world has done, their be- done its best. When I say world, I, I'm not just trying to sound like an old guy, you know, warning against all the, you know, end of doom and whatever. When I say world, I mean the way the Bible means it. What is not spiritual, what is not transformed by Christ, what is secular, what is material, what is out there, what is not biblical. The world is more than just a sphere. It's a concept of worldliness. And so when I say when the world has, I don't just mean like, you know, all the bad guys or whatever. I'm not just trying to pick on culture. I mean the way that the Bible means it. That which is not spiritual. It is opposed to what Christ has intended. So the world has largely attempted to redefine culture, or redefine sexuality. Culture has tried to provide alternative lifestyles. We've addressed some of those. And so largely, I I think I can speak with the majority of agreement, except that I know you are hearing different things on TV, and you're seeing different things on TV, and your kids are on social media, and your teenagers are exposed to completely different definitions and terms that you may not even know. And so, while I know as the majority speaking here, that that you as developing, mature, adult believers are agreeing with me, your kids are deciding whether or not they agree with me. That's where they are right now. If this is for them. And so I don't want to make the mistake of assuming too much. And I want to encourage you not to make the mistake of assuming your kids are just agreeing with you. Because the way the world paints it, the way that our flesh paints it, taps into our wants. So we're going to go back to the very beginning and we're going to talk about God's design for biblical sexuality. Um, I will will use some terms today that you're not used to hearing me use from the pulpit. Um, I discussed at staff meeting, I discussed with our deacons, we discussed as pastoral staff, you know, are these the how how deep should we go here? And the reality is, either they'll hear about it in the church, or they'll hear they'll hear about it on Instagram, or they'll hear about it in a public school, or they'll hear about it from their Christian school friends, Christian school friends. And so the church needs to be leading, not following. To begin. I want to take you to France. Anyone have been to France? Good for you. <laughs> I have not been, but there is a famous bridge in Paris, and you may know the one that I am pointing to, or that I'm referring to. The Pont des Arts Bridge. I'm sure I'm butchering that. <laughs> but I'm not going to say it like a southerner, because then that would really butcher it. All right. It's a famous bridge where lovers will go and they'll buy a lock. And maybe they'll have their name engraved in the lock or their initials or they'll color or decorate the lock or maybe they won't. They'll just buy a lock and they'll connect it to this bridge. This tradition theoretically started back in 2009. There was a film that was made or something that's it's hard to actually point to the origin of the tradition, but, but traditionally, since 2009, one of the things to do if you're in Paris is to buy a lock and go to this bridge and profess your love to your, 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 your significant other by buying a lock and putting it on the bridge. Back in 2015, however, all of the locks were removed And a sign was placed on the bridge forbidding the placing of locks. 
Now, what kind of romantic killjoy got involved in that, right? <laughs> You're exactly right. Someone said engineer. That's 75% the case. The other 25% of the case is, of course, social warriors who, you know, were concerned that it was, you know, desecrating a public bridge or something. But the displays of love with these locks literally weakened the foundation of the bridge to the point that the bridge got so heavy, they were concerned about its structural integrity. And if you can't walk on a bridge, you don't really need the bridge. It's not serving its purpose. So all of the locks were removed. And the sign was placed forbidding the, the, the continuance of this tradition. You could say then that the beauty of the displays of love actually weakened the foundation. So it was the beauty of the love that caused a weakening of the foundation. But note, if you remove the foundation, you actually had no potential at all for that love or the expression of that love to exist on that bridge to begin with. So actually, no foundation means, or in this case of the bridge, you had no beauty or potential for that love of expression, or that expression of love. And this morning, I want to show you from Genesis that biblical sexuality, biblical sexuality, the purity of sex the way God intended it, is a bridge that maintains both beauty and and foundation. And if you redefine biblical sexuality, you lose both the beauty and the foundation. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the realities that contribute to the beauty and foundation of biblical sexuality. There are many ways to do this. But we're just going to work with three observations from Genesis chapter 1 through 3. Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Your kids are struggling. Perhaps you're struggling. Perhaps you have struggled. Your teenagers are internally asking questions as to whether or not God's way is not only right, but if it's actually fulfilling. And we can dismiss that question as selfish, but I don't think that we should. You realize that the desire for human fulfillment is God-given. The desire for meaning and purpose is internal. And when we look at fulfillment and meaning and purpose, pleasure and purpose, we find it perfectly in the wisdom of God culminated in God's design for sexuality, foundation, and beauty. The first observation I want to give you regarding biblical sexuality is in primarily in chapter 1 of Genesis. Now this is going to be some overview work of Genesis chapters 1 through 3, all right? And our first observation is this. Biblical sexuality is intended to display true unity. Biblical sexuality is intended to display true unity. You say, well, where do we see this? We actually see it from the very outset. Genesis chapter 1. We see the Trinity on display. We see the Trinity on display. And, and, and you will not find a more foundational, perfect unity than what we find in the reality of the Godhead. 
And this unity is on display in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. Now, it's not explicit here, but if you look at um, necessary New Testament realities and texts, we know that Jesus was operative in creation. John chapter 1, without, without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians chapter 1, He is the Creator of all, visible and invisible. You say, well, how, how active was Jesus? Very active. I, I don't know the details of this. I mean, it's not like we have you know, their, their plan for creation in bullet points here, right? But we know that Jesus was very active. And I would say operative. But actually, we see that the Spirit Himself was active. God, the Spirit, was active. And the Spirit of God, verse 2, hovered over the face of the waters. So the Spirit is involved in creation. You see from the very outset, Genesis chapter 1, from the very outset, the writer introduces for us the concept of unity in the person of the Godhead. And it's clearer if you go to verse 26 and you note the plurals. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock and over every moving thing that moves in the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So plural, let us make man in our plural image. Verse 27, so God made man in his singular own image. The triunity of God displays the, the initial establishment of of the priority of unity from the very beginning, you realize that in reality, Christianity is an unfolding, is an expression of the Trinity. This is why Christianity is never, is never singular. It's never singular. Even if, you, even if you go to the Old Testament, what does God promise Abraham? A people. And those people do well and they fail, and they do well and they fail, and they do well and they fail. And then he, in the New Testament through Christ, what does he establish? A church, a community. But I skipped one and I skipped it on purpose. There's a second community that is in this very text in chapters 1 through 3. It's the community of family. And so first of all, unity is on display in the Trinity, but secondly, unity is on display in marriage. God's story in the Bible is a unified story of unity because God is perfectly unified in Himself, and oneness displays this nature. Biblical sexuality is a picture of oneness. You say, well, where do we see this? Let me show you. So He's established Oneness in the Trinity, and now he's going to establish oneness in the concept of marriage. Just look with me in chapter 1, verse 4. What does it say? God saw that it was good. Now look with me at verse 12. What does it say? God saw that it was good. Now look with me at verse 18. What does it say? God saw that it was good. Verse 21, God saw that it was good. Verse 25, God saw that it was good. What was good? Each thing that He had made. It was good. Now look at verse 31. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. Now go to chapter 2. 
And look with me at verse 18. And the Lord said, it is not good. What isn't good? That man should be alone. And so what does he do about this lack in man's life? This incompleteness in Adam's existence and reality. What does he do? It is not good that man should be alone. So I will make him a helper. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place, closed up the flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Such a beautiful passage. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. His creation is good. The Trinity is good. What they have done in what God, the Godhead has done in creation, each member, each person of the Trinity has done is good. And the creation of man is incomplete. It is not good. So what does he do? He provides for the man woman. And the men say, Amen. And I'm not joking. God in His grace and wisdom, and I don't mean this in like a hokey romantic way, completes the man by giving him woman. Oneness. Because you know what takes place after this, and we'll talk about it more in just a moment. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. By the way, this is why homosexuality has neither beauty nor foundation. It does not complete. Because the woman completes man. And man needed the woman. Who are we to think that reinventions could possibly be wiser and more fulfilling than God. Listen, I know, friends, I know, family, I know marriage is hard. It's got its ups and its downs. And sometimes the downs are really down and sometimes the ups are are really up and things are really challenging. But fundamentally, and teenagers listen to me, young people listen to me, Fundamentally, do you know what God has provided for you if you do sexuality His way? Husbands and wives, do we know what God has provided for us if we do sexuality His way? His ultimate wisdom on display. And it brings both fulfillment and structure, security, foundation to our life. Nothing in the world promises this. Listen to me, not even you and your kids. I would suffer anything for my children like that. But my role, because, my, because God has intended my wife as my helper, husbands and wives, My role is to be such a husband that she is fulfilled and has foundation. Your children are discipled to leave. Did you hear that? Your spouse is discipled to stay. 
And there are many problems in the church because we've reversed those. And too many young families, too many families in general, invest all of their time and relationship into their children. And they have none left for the founding human relationship of marriage. So disciple your spouse so that it's a delight to stay. And disciple your children so that it's a delight when they leave. So biblical sexuality is intended to display true unity. In the Trinity and in the establishment of man and woman, the oneness of man and woman. Secondly, biblical sexuality is intended for foundational functionality. Foundational functionality. You say, well, that doesn't sound very romantic. Okay, well, we'll get to that in just a minute, all right? Remember I said that biblical sexuality maintains both beauty and foundation. But it's foundation beyond just familial foundation. It's actually human foundation. You say, what are you talking about? Now, I'm not going to work all the way through it, but... um, because it would take too much time. But if you, if you read chapters 1 and 2, or chapter 1 of the creation account, there's two primary things that function in the creation, of, uh, creation account. It's forming. Look with me at chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form. That is physical form. It had no... Uh, tangible reality. It was without form and void. And then if you look at chapter 2, verse 19, now out of the ground the Lord had formed. This is a word that is implying his act of creation. So he formed the expanse. He formed the ground. He formed the waters. But then he did something with what he has formed. He filled it. So the the creation account is a summary of forming and filling. So he made the expanse, and then he filled it with stars. And I love how the, the biblical writer says this. And he made the stars also. Like, you know, like God just threw a few out there. The most... One of the most cosmically astounding things in this reality. It was like, oh, by the way, God did this just as a little garnish for us. He formed the expanse and he filled it with stars and planets. He formed the seas and he filled it with fish. He formed the earth and he filled it with animals. But he has a design for how it will perpetuate itself. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 22. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill. This is biology. God's plan for the perpetuation of nature has a functional biological aspect. And he commands the same of humanity. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 28. And God said to them, that's man and woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Biblical sexuality biologically forms and founds the family. And God has intended family, why? For community, because community is an expression of the Godhead. Oneness and unity is an expression of the Godhead. So the beauty that God provides through the functional aspect of biblical sexuality, that is reproduction, is that God maintains through it the beauty of community and family. So the functional aspect is actually necessary for the fulfilling aspect. Listen, when I get home, 
And Everly runs up and she starts as fast as she can telling me about her day. My daughter is not a summarizer. <laughs> She's a storyteller, you know? And when my son, and some of you see it in nursery when I get to pick him up from class, when my son drops everything and runs and grabs me and gives me a hug, and when my daughter hobbles over, my littlest one hobbles over and holds up her arms, snot dripping everywhere, you know. <laughs> and that moment, I don't care how dirty she is, and you just pick her up. Now, I know family's not always that beautiful. But that moment of fulfillment is God's grace and wisdom in providing the biological necessity and joy of biblical sexuality. Biblical sexuality has a functional aspect, and the functional aspect is necessary for the fulfilling aspect of family. If you lose the foundation of biblical sexuality, you lose the foundation of family, which is exactly what we are seeing in culture. Do you know why the world's falling apart? Do you know why cultures are becoming more sinful? the foundation of family crumbles. If you, can, if you can redefine marriage, you can literally change the world and not for the better. Biblical sexuality is intended for functional, for foundational functionality. From a very basic practical aspect here and 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 I don't want to I don't want to falsely characterize but there is a growing trend and and I think it's a byproduct of the feminist movement there's a growing trend that thinks kids are just annoyances and aggravations and you follow your own life, and you chart your own course, and you follow your dreams. And if kids happen, that's great. If they don't, then, I mean, they're difficult anyway. God intended the earth to be filled. <laughs> if God in his sovereignty has ordained you to struggle with having children than adopt and have children and lead families. God gives us His grace, His goodness and joy by providing biblical sexuality. And you realize that means that any alternative form other than what God has intended, therefore, cannot provide what God has intended. So, and I don't want to be crass, and I don't want to oversimplify, but young people, listen to me. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Logically, biologically, practically, spiritually, and it certainly doesn't work in bringing you pleasure. A husband and a wife are, are contributing to the joy and love and self-giving of one another. Homosexuality, transgenderism, these alternative forms are individuals looking to the other for their own pleasure. And they'll never find it. Do you know why? It doesn't exist outside of how God designed it. Now that can be true of two completely lustful heterosexual people as well, by the way. And is. Which is why biblical sexuality is to remain pure, is pure in its intention. 
Which leads us to our third reality and observation. And I know we're not getting back to Ephesians. I knew that would happen anyway. Third observation. Biblical sexuality is intended to display true beauty. True beauty. Chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Do you know why married people don't cling too hard on the in-laws anymore? You know, he's a mama's boy and can't let go. And, you know, she wants to be at moms all the time and is always gossiping about husband with the sisters. It's really unbiblical. It's really sinful. Because a husband and wife leave father and mother and they hold fast to one another. What a joy. What an, and, I'm, and I know I'm blessed. I, got, I have the best wife in the world, and I'm not just saying that. I know I'm blessed, but what an incredible privilege that God has given man and woman to enjoy one another. Verse 24 and 25, they, rejo- they, they enjoy one another in the singularity of their relationship. F- they leave father and mother. Now, why would he even say that? They don't have a physical father and mother. Have you ever thought about the logic of that? Why is that so significant? The point is being established that they are, they, they are one apart from any other relationship. It's a unique relationship. They're one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. This is the physical, sexual consummation, finalization realization of their oneness. The purity of biblical sex, biblical intimacy, confirms the relational oneness of husband and wife. God, in His wisdom and grace, has provided a foundation for humanity. Listen, the functional foundation that we talked about that also brings some of the highest human pleasure and divine Purposes. If you reduce sexuality down to only pleasure, you lose purpose. Which is why sexuality must take place within the context of marriage, because that was the design. And even the physical pleasure will be tainted. If you maintain God's intention for sexuality, you both enjoy the fulfillment of pleasure and purpose. Now, I don't really have time to show you this, but if you walk through the creation narrative and you look at this beautiful text that the woman, just follow the structure. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's not good that man's alone and so he brings woman to the man and, he, and she completes him and, 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 and they're together, they're one flesh. And verse 25, the sexual union is the finalization, the final point made of their oneness. It's a beautiful structure, it's a, it's a beautiful truth, it's a beautiful pattern When a man and a wife in the context of marriage enjoy one another the way God has intended, they are not only experiencing the, the, the pleasure of marriage that's unique to marriage, they're enjoying the beauty of purity that God has intended. But then a problem happens in chapter three, and this is very significant, and I want to show it to you. What does it say in verse 25? They were naked and they were not ashamed. There was innocence. There was beauty to this purity. It wasn't tainted with shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And so we have the first verse in a long and sad story. Has God really said 
take it and eat it. And she does. And she gives it to her husband. And the husband, failing to lead, receives it and eats it as well. Now, if you would look with me at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You say, what in the world is going on there? You have to see it in light of verse 25. They were naked and they weren't ashamed. And now sin has entered the world. And now the curse has brought ruin. And God desires to meet with them in the garden again. Because that's what they do. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to them, Where are you? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. He knows where they are. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. And why does he say he hid himself? I was naked, and I hid myself. And God, rhetorical question number two, who told you that you were naked? The point is obvious. They now feel shame. They're the only two humans in the world. It doesn't matter if they're clothed or not from a functional aspect. They experience spiritual shame because now the innocence and the beauty of purity that God intended apart from sin is tainted with sin. The immediate casualty of the fall, its first fruit, is shame projected upon the innocence of purity. And Paul refers to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for while we were still in this tent, he's using tent as an image for the body. We groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. God is in a continual process of reversing the shame of the fall as He sanctifies us away from sin and into the purity of Christ. But here's the problem, family. Here's the problem. The culture is now so sinfully sexualized that the fall has has so degenerated mankind that there's no shame at all. So you can show your body however you want, whatever context you want, whatever media outlet you want, you can wear whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, and it doesn't matter. TV used to have restrictions for guidelines for what you could see in nudity. The only problem is now there's streaming services that aren't restricted by those TV guidelines. You can watch basically pornography. There's no shame at all. You say, well, that's dark, yes. But for verse 15... And I will put enmity between you, that's Satan and the woman, and between her, your offspring and her offspring. And, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman I will surely multiply, multiply your pain and childbearing and you shall bring forth children. You say, well, how in the world can all of this shame be undone? How can there possibly be good news after this? It's in that little word, he, in verse 15. He, the seed of the woman, will redeem and transform, and he will bring purity, and he will bring light, and he will save us from from a culture that is wrought with sexual sin and sexual darkness. He will make things pure again. How? By the process of biblical childbearing. That through the line of David, 
the seed of the woman. Who takes away the shame? Christ alone. Who purifies? Christ alone. You say, well, I, I've done a lot of, I've messed up in a lot of the ways that you're talking about. Christ brings light. You say, well, I don't, I don't know where to go from here. I'm stuck in sexual sin. Christ gives grace. And young person, if you're really tempted to go after the, what, the, what the world promised you in, in sexual fulfillment, you will find disappointment after disappointment. Christ alone and God's intention fulfills both family foundation and true human fulfillment. Let's pray.